You stand on the shore of the ocean watching the tide come in. You sense the call of the sea beckoning to take you in further. You step forward little by little not knowing what to expect, but expecting more. You keep going as the ocean calls and calls, calls you to enter in to deeper waters. Welcome to the Deeper Waters Podcast. I am your host, Nick Peters, seeking to bring you the very best in Christian apologetics and scholarship. Today, we've got an interesting show, especially in light of everything that's been going on recently in the culture, and I actually had this show prepared before everything came out, so maybe it's just, this is a little bit of serendipity or something. But anyway, my guest is Glenn Stanton, and we're going to be talking about marriage today. Now, Glenn Stanton is the director of Family Formation Studies that focus on the family in Colorado Springs, and he's a research fellow at the Institute of Marriage and Family in Ottawa. He debates and lectures extensively on issues of gender, sexuality, marriage, and parenting at universities and churches around the world. He served the George W. Bush administration for many years as a consultant on increasing fatherhood involvement in the Head Start program. Stanton is the author of five books about marriage and families, including why Marriage Matters, Reasons to Believe in Marriage in Postmodern Society, My Crazy Imperfect Christian Family, Boy, that, that doesn't describe anyone's family, I know, but okay, <laughs> and Marriage on Trial, The Case Against Same-Sex Marriage and Parenting, which was featured on C-SPAN Book TV. Stanton has also been interviewed on the Los Angeles NPR show Air Talk. He's also a contributing author to nine others, and after which we can add in, he was interviewed on the Deeper Waters podcast. His latest book, Loving My Neighbor, My LGBT Neighbor, that is, Being Friends in Grace and Truth, explores how Christians should interact with gay or lesbian neighbors in a Christ-honoring way. He is also the author of The Ring Makes All the Difference and Secure Daughters, Confident Sons, How Parents Guide Their Children, Their Authentic Masculinity and Femininity. He is a graduate of the University of West Florida with graduate degrees in philosophy and history. He now makes his home in Colorado Springs with his wife and five children. So, Glenn, uh, Dr. Stanton, welcome to the, uh, the Deeper Waters podcast. Well, Nick, it is good to be with you, and I, I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, if my audience doesn't really know who you are, can you tell us a bit about you know, like who you are as a person, how you got to be so interested in the marriage and family d- debates? You know what? That's a good question. I, you know, my my main time full job is is working at Focus on the Family, and what I do there is, you know, my title, Director of Family Formation Studies. Essentially, what I do is study the family as a social institution from a theological, anthropological, and sociological perspective. Um, I've worked at Focus uh, right out of my graduate studies and started there in 1993 but really got interested in this whole issue um, from being a teenager and being involved in the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, working in that, fighting in that, um, laboring in that, and then realizing, you know, that the abortion issue and and what causes it and and contributes to it is really a family issue. Um, Mm -hmm. Dealing with marriage and family cohesion. Because women who, you know, get pregnant with, um, you know, if, if the man would marry them, take care of them, um, they are not likely, you know, to have abortions. So I, you know, kind of moving upstream a bit um, and being interested in the family, and, I mean, that has been my full-time work mm-hmm. uh, for the last 25 years or so, and especially recently with the attack upon the family, mm-hmm. uh, same-sex marriage, things like that, right. uh, have been dealing a lot with the gender issue. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing the gender issue, especially in light of events like Bruce Jenner and such. Oh, my goodness, yes, yes. A lot of, in the same-sex marriage issue all the way through the 2000s, but yeah, the Bruce, the Bruce Jenner thing and the transgender thing has just exploded on the stage um, mm-hmm. in such a big way. And people, you know, have such a difficult time kind of understanding the ins and outs of that. So doing a lot of research there, a lot of speaking, a lot of writing um, on that topic. 
Now, when we talk about marriage and family, since you started a family, why don't we just start with this basic question. What is a family? You know, that is a good question. And the answer that we used to give um, was the question that the Census Bureau had, and it was a group of people related by blood, marriage, and adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, you know, we have same-sex couples that can be related by marriage. So I would say um, that, you know, focus on the family, we've kind of reworked our definition, and that is um, family is a group of people um, established on marriage um, between a husband and a wife and their biological and adopted children and their extended um you know, their extended family. So, mm -hmm. you know, primarily it is um, ideally something established on the union of marriage mm -hmm. between a husband and a wife. Now, historically, marriage has been seen as the bedrock of society, hasn't it, of the family? Ab absolutely. And even as a Christian, the way that I, you know, really encourage Christians to understand it is it's, I'll say this it may sound kind of strange to your listeners, but it's not a Christian institution, nor is it a, a religious institution. Right. It is a human institution mm -hmm. in the sense of it's a common good. You know, right. the theologians use that phrase. God gives it to everybody. And just like water and mm -hmm. sunshine and, you know, food, those are graces given to us by God that because of how we're designed as human beings, every culture needs this thing called marriage mm -hmm. and every culture has had it from the beginning of time almost as you know the anthropologist would tell us but we say almost as if you know the very first two people that came upon the earth you know marriage was a part of what they did but every culture has marriage every culture requires marriage and it's always between the two streams of society or humanity male and female now, when we talk about how if this was a common good, I, I actually agree with that. Would we include it in such things such as, say, natural law, that you don't need the Bible or Christianity to know good and evil? Yeah. I mean, we can say, for instance, you need God to exist to have those, but it's but knowing God, you don't have to know him to know those. It, it's part of a common good, but Christianity does have something to say about all of those. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. and that's the thing is, I mean, it's, you know, it's a simplistic phrase, but it's helpful sometimes is, you know what, you, um, the owner's manual essentially is, is written in law, but it's good to know who wrote the owner's manual, mm -hmm. and, you know, to know the creator, to know he mm -hmm. who created it, and why he created it, and how he created it. Now, is it true that there have been some societies that have tried to destroy the family in some ways and such? I'm thinking that, if I'm remembering correctly, when I read the Communist Manifesto, it even suggested having all of our wives in common. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And, I mean, Plato, when you go all the way back to, you know, sort of the agreement and disagreement between Aristotle and Plato, Plato in his Republic, Mm -hmm. He talked about a new kind of society where all the women, all the men would be held in common, all the children would be held in common, and that there would be certain breeders for the state, mm -hmm. and that all children would be raised by the state. And, you know, Plato, pretty brilliant guy, um, but you check in history and it's like, okay, name the society where that actually worked. Mm -hmm. Now, Aristotle, in his politics, he talks about, I mean, it really is from him that that phrase or the idea of the nuclear family came about. He said that the, the smallest, irreducible part of every community, every society, is mother, father, and the children. Mm -hmm. And then, out, you know, surrounding that is aunts, uncles, siblings, brothers and sisters, you know, grandparents. Mm -hmm. And then it, it moves out from there into the village, into the town, into the state. Um, you're right, in the Communist Manifesto, that was an idea. It never worked. And then you had um, something that I would encourage your listeners to do, to kind of do a little 
deeper study is something that was created in upstate New York called the Oneida community. Mm -hmm. Basically, that was a kind of a, a idealistic community in the 1850s that was a kind of cultish Christian group, but they believed that they should hold all women and all men in common and that all children should be held in common. That only lasted not even a generation. Again, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. And then you had kind of the hippie communes where they shared everything in common. Like Hayden Ashbury? To, to everybody else. And you know what? It has never worked. Yeah. It never lasted more than a generation. Mm. When you talk about hippie communes, you mean something like Hayden Ashbury, right? Well, more so. I mean, Hayden Hay Ashbury in San Francisco was like a, a neighborhood. These are more like, you know what, let's move out to Oregon, let's, you know, do organic farming, let's be self-sufficient, um, and we will have free love, and we'll raise the kids together, and, you know, those kinds of things, and it's, you know, peace, love, and understanding, and all that cool mm -hmm. stuff, but it's a self-confined community, but the thing that usually prob happens there is sexual jealousy. Right. You know, that's the thing that always ruins these communities because you know mm -hmm. what? You need, um, you need those intimate, exclusive relationships where I have a relationship with my wife, she has a relationship with me. Monogamy cuts down on, um, competition for women, you know, keeps yeah. women from being collected. And it makes sure, it basically is, it's the democratization it's the democratization, if you will, of sexuality. It, it makes everything safe and secure and balanced. Yeah, it, it is a way that a lot of us are, especially I think we men, trust me, if I knew that my wife was talking to some men on a friendly level and such, yeah. which will happen sometimes, I wouldn't have much of a problem. But if I found out one of them, even one of my good friends, had started hitting on her, it'd probably be like, yeah, um, we've got a lot of land here, I've got a shovel. You're not going to be missed, okay? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? It's interesting that, that that is another reason that all cultures have marriage. The sociologists or the anthropologists will tell us, first of all, I mean, when you read the leading anthropologists over the last hundred years, they will say the first thing that marriage does is regulate sexuality. Right. And think about this. Even today... Like, I mean, you go to one of the crudest places, maybe a biker bar or something, mm -hmm. and nobody, if a guy sleeps with another woman, you never hear another guy go, dude, you can't sleep with her. She's cohabiting, you know? Yeah. But yeah. you hear somebody go, dude, she's married. You can't sleep with her. Even in those sort of, you know, yeah. they don't have many morals, but they do recognize when a woman is married, She's off the sexual market, and and you don't mess with her. Yeah, I'm um, kind of kind of thinking also about in a, a parallel situation. If I came home one day and said, uh, "I'm sorry, but I just uh, stopped at the bookstore, and I couldn't help myself. I spent a little bit more than I should have. Can you forgive me?" I mean, she'll be upset with me. She might let me have it a bit, but she'll forgive me. But if I came home and said, "Hun, I'm sorry, I was just..." out cruising around, picked up another woman, went and slept with her, and I'm here back home now, can you forgive me? It'd be a different story. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that is marriage settles men down. Right. You know, um, there is a reason, even if you had, you know, and, and you're just kind of a regular man, if you had the opportunity and it presented itself, you know, you know what, I've got to go home to my wife. I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to face her wrath. Yeah. Um, and you know what? That settles men down. It's, that's another thing that the sociologists and the anthropologists will tell us. The phrase that they use is that marriage domesticates men. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is being such a mystery, though, because if marriage is such a good thing, then why are we Christians so upset about extending it to homosexuals together? Well, I mean, you know, Nick, I know that's a, that's a if you will, devil's advocate question, but yeah. that is, is absolutely what's being presented to us. Mm -hmm. But the issue is 
marriage, unfortunately today, we have so romanticized marriage to marriage is just about people loving one another and setting up a wonderful, happily life together rather than the idea of marriage is a relationship that people enter to, you know, yes, it does satisfy their, their, their needs in terms of um, relationship and intimacy and things like that. But we also marry for the community. Marriage is a community good. That is why marriages take place in every culture. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I may not call it marriage, but you know these marriage-like things happen in every culture publicly so that the community, it's not just for a party, but so that the community hears, okay, this man now belongs to her, and she now belongs to him, and it's a community good. Marriage in that way is important. There is a social need for men and women to marry one another, but there is no social need for men to marry other men and women to marry other women. It is simply built on personal desire. That is not true of heterosexual marriage. And so it really comes down to, because of how humanity is wired, because we exist in male and female, marriage needs to be what it is and to define it as same sex is to radically redefine and restructure the institution itself yeah i'm thinking about when i uh, moved to charlotte when i was going to seminary i moved with a friend of mine who was in missouri where i was in tennessee at the time and i'm back here in tennessee now Mm -hmm. and we roomed up together now that was good for us but Society had no reason to really care, <laughs> as long as we were paying our bills and things like that. And yeah, we could contribute to society individually and even as friends, but really, they had no reason to care whatsoever. But then, somehow along the way, uh, we realized after a couple of years, we, when we made our sort of, to use the Big Bang Theory terms, roommate agreement, yeah. that the... We never included a marriage clause in there about what happens if one of us meets someone. And so that, that changed our plans rather quickly. And one thing I found is that uh, people were very interested in that relationship instead. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that is an excellent point because, you know what? You guys were roommates. You had a relationship. You liked each other. But the state had no interest whatsoever Mm -hmm. in that relationship because there were no social implications um, for if it went south, right? Right. But what if someone might say, well, the state, well, who cares about the state? Maybe the state should just get out of the marriage business altogether. You know, there are so many Christians who say that, and there's, you know, many pastors who say that, and flat out, anybody who says that, and I, uh, I'm i going to sound like I'm overstating this, but mm-hmm. it's, I'm not, anybody who says that has no understanding of what marriage itself is as a human institution. Marriage is, first of all, not a faith institution, a religious institution, or even a moral institution. It is a state institution in the sense of any community of people, any group of people coming together and fashioning a public life together, you need to find a way to regulate sexuality, you need to find a way to regulate productivity, not in terms of limiting, but saying it's, it's you know, the anthropological fa- uh, phrase that we don't use anymore, legitimizing the children. Whose children are these? Who do they belong to? What mm-hmm. lineage are they a part of? So there's all these things that if you let the state, you know, say, okay, we have no interest in marriage, well, society starts to break down. Mm-hmm. Well, in ways. Yeah. Well, Glenn, I mean, you've been talking about children, though. I mean, but there are some couples that get married and they don't have children and they choose to not have children. So, I mean, having children isn't necessary to marriage, so why should we care if some relationships come together that can't have children? 
Yeah, and that's a great question too, Nick. You're you're asking all the important questions. <laughs> but we have to understand that yes, there are couples who don't have children, mm -hmm. but we know that marriage is the um, marriage and children are the norm. They're not right. required, but they're the norm. And I mm -hmm. say, if you doubt that, ask any mother or mother-in-law when their children get married. What are they asking the question? You know what? I want grandchildren. You guys need to get busy. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's not because they have a particular romantic view or they have a Christian view or a Jewish view or a secular view. You know what? Marriage in the hearts and minds of people, um, it means children. You know, mm -hmm. and, and when a couple says, you know what, we're not interested in children, the people around us, we may not judge, but we will think a lot of times, oh, you know, you're going to be sorry about that one day. When there's a couple who has um, infertility problem, mm -hmm. we don't think, well, you know, your, your, your reproductive materials are just not working. You know, we, we are sad for them. We, we mourn for them. Mm -hmm. So, yes, ma ch childbearing is not an absolute essential, but it is the norm. Mm -hmm. But, as you know, we all well know, what is the norm for same-sex couples? The norm for same-sex couples is not to be reproductive. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to go to great, great lengths in order to bring children into their relationships. And mm -hmm. so... It's, you know, it, it strays us away from um, what marriage is about. It's about children, um, but it also is about how it um, changes both the man and the woman who enter marriage. It, it, it changes adults, too. It turns them oh, yeah. into different kind of adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely so. I've, uh, one thing I've said before is that uh, when I got married... I wasn't very a confident guy in many ways at all. And I've been doing a project for years, and people were telling me so many good compliments, but I was the one who was most skeptical of him. Mm. And then after I got married, I know somehow that started changing. And when Ali and I went to a conference together just about four months after we got married, that's how quick it was before things had started changing, and I realized that. And we went to a talk on marriage and family. I went to the lady afterwards who gave it, who in fact used to help me with confidence issues. Mm -hmm. And talked to her and said, you know, I think I've figured it out as I was just sitting here listening to this. And I think I know what it is that makes the difference. It's that as a man, man before that, my identity used to be centered around how well I did in the Apologetics community. And so mm -hmm. I was guarding everything entirely and I couldn't take any criticism whatsoever easily now I'm married and I have my affirmation from my wife and that leaves yeah. me a whole lot more free to perform it's not as if in those four months I suddenly started hitting the books a lot more oh now I have so much more knowledge and I'm much more confident what changed it was I got married yeah yeah and you got somebody in your corner right you know I Nick that is exactly my same story. When mm -hmm. my wife met me, we, we met in high school. Mm -hmm. I blinked like crazy. And I blinked like crazy because of nerves, mm -hmm. because of like you, lack of confidence. But my wife, um, I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And shortly after meeting her, um, I stopped doing that. And it was, I mean, it was remarkable. Like, okay, mm -hmm. how come? Well, because of the confidence that she gave me. Right. Uh, please think about this, Nick. If, if you filled up any sports arena and you had a speaker, and, you know, it's a marriage event, and you asked men, men who are married, I don't care how long you're married, are you a better man today, more skilled, more talented, more confident, mm -hmm. because of the woman, the wife in your life? The place would all laugh. And they wouldn't laugh because it's a silly question. They would laugh because it's an obvious question. Mm -hmm. And the women would laugh, too, because they know, you know what? I helped make the man that my man has become today. And mm -hmm. men who are well-married, they know that, and it's undeniable. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd say it, a lot of my friends have seen the change in me too. But to get back to the topic about the homosexual unions and such, yeah, I mean, I mean, then what if we're just you know being intolerant bigots right now? We we just hate homosexuals or. We're afraid of homosexuality or find it icky or something like that. I mean, isn't that really what's going on? Well, you know, that... I am pretty patient mm -hmm. with those people that I debate from the other side. Mm -hmm. But I am absolutely impatient and get angry, not out of control angry, but it's like, okay, you know what? You're going to say that gloves off. Because mm -hmm. of the implications and the accusation is so vile. Yeah. You know, the, the question, um, and way back when, you know, a couple of years ago, um, I would ask the question before he, quote, quote, unquote, evolved on the issue. You know what? I have the same position that President Barack Obama has. Is he ugly? Is he bigoted? Um, and then the question now is, when was it that he stopped being bigoted, hateful, ugly? Mm -hmm. Right? Of course. It's, it's, you know what, if, if you're going to say the religious people, the conservatives are bigoted and ugly because they oppose, then you've got to, you've got to paint Hillary Clinton with that brush when she was opposed to it, Bill Clinton with that brush, mm -hmm. and so many other people. And that just reveals just how nasty, um, that accusation is. So I would say to Christians who get accused of that, you know what, Get angry and yeah. say, and I will say, it is vile, vile of you to make that comparison. It's mm -hmm. interesting, in the Supreme Court decision, you know, you had all these dissents, and they weren't just dissents, they were outright denunciations. The justice who spoke most forcefully against that bigot accusation and the equation of, well, you know, we used to not let black and white couples marry, and now we've overcome that, and this is exactly like that. It was Clarence Thomas who spoke against both of those things. Mm -hmm. The only black gentleman, of course, on the Supreme Court, and the only one in a mixed-race marriage. Mm -hmm. And he completely rejected both of those analogies, and it's good that he did, because they are manipulative, and we need to see them that way. Well, let's talk a little bit about the whole interracial thing, because we're told that a lot of times. I mean, didn't we change the nature of marriage when we allowed interracial marriage to take place? Well, that, uh, uh, now are you asking when we when we um, when we prohibited it or when we allowed it? When we allowed it. I mean, that yeah. was one change yeah. to marriage and redefine marriage so homosexuals can join him. That's just another change, isn't it? Well, you know what, I mean, and, and we hear that. We hear that so many times. But first of all, we need to kind of look at that backwards and say that it has never been a human universal that people of different races couldn't matter, marry, marry. Yeah. First of all, we need to understand that, you know, they talk about Loving versus Virginia. That was the, and it really was a great Supreme Court decision that said the bans on interracial marriage were unconstitutional. But what it really was about was not interracial marriage. It was about blacks marrying whites and whites marrying blacks. Mm -hmm. What segregationists did was they used marriage for their vile social purposes. Mm -hmm. They wanted to keep blacks and whites apart. So they signed up, if you will, or enlisted marriage into their cause. Marriage is not about, and it never has been about, keeping the races apart. Mm -hmm. It's about bringing men and women together. Mm -hmm. So just as we're seeing same-sex marriage today as a social experimentation, a social agenda, actually it's same-sex marriage that is like, uh, the bans on interracial marriage. It was mm -hmm. using marriage to do something that marriage was never intended to do. Mm -hmm. Then it was keeping the races apart. Today it is bringing men and men and women and women together. Well, what is it, in your opinion, that makes a marriage that separates the heterosexual union from the homosexual union? Well, it's it, in some sense the obvious that 
the heterosexual union involves um, the two parts of humanity. Um, it brings them together. Mm -hmm. And many times we think, well, you know, that doesn't really matter. Um, we're all just human beings, and two men can come together and create the same sort of relationship that a man and a woman can. What we need to look at is, and especially as Christians, you go back to Genesis 1, and it says, as we know, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Mm -hmm. In the image of God, he created them, comma. Okay, what is that thing in the image of God? It is man and woman, male and female, he created them. When male and female come together in a marital sexual union, something dramatic is happening there oh, yeah. that is shown in no other human relationship. And now, mm -hmm. two women, or I'm sorry, two men, two women cannot... Um, exemplify that because there is no gender difference. Now let me give you just two practicals um, you know from the very start. What do we know about same-sex male relationships, even long-term relationships, and what do we know about serious committed lesbian relationships? There is research that shows us, and there's a wealth of research, that two men in committed relationships they are extremely likely, nearly by 50% or just over 50%, to work out deals among themselves and agreements among themselves for what I call extracurricular sexual activities. Mm -hmm. You ask gay men in long-term relationships if they are monogamous, and they will ask you many, many times, now do you mean faithful or monogamous? And, you know, you, you'll stop and, and, okay, so tell, you know, tell me the difference. Mm -hmm. And they'll say monogamy is only having sex with one person. Fidelity is living by the rules of the relationship. Mm -hmm. Most of us have said, ourselves, like, okay, what's the difference there? Well, they, because men, by their nature, their, their basic male nature, are more explorative and experimental sexually they will have, the, they'll seek to have their cake and eat it too. You know what? We want somebody to come home to. We want somebody to cook with and share a home with and build a life with. But we also want to have outside activities. So many times the gay male couple will make agreements. You know what? You can't ever bring anybody back to our house and be in our bed. Or you can only have these extra activities when you're out of town or only do them in town. And either, you know, they can't be emotionally filled, but they, they make these agreements. And so they are, and, and, you know, many, many, many gay male marriages will be that. So they are redefining marriage to say that marriage is not necessarily about monogamy or fidelity. That has to do with the male nature. And without a woman in that relationship to kind of put her hands on her hips and say, no, 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 that's not going to happen, um, you know what? These men make allowances for that. Now, on the lesbian side of the aisle, lesbian relationships, even serious committed ones, lesbian relationships break up at tremendously high rates. And the, the pro-lesbian researchers and lesbians themselves who do this, do this research they know that that's true. Now, why do they break up at tremendously high rates? It has to do with the fact that there is a female nature. Females more than males are more relationally intense. You know, if, oh, yeah. if there's one partner in the relationship who says, you know, we need to sit down and talk about our relationship, it's usually the woman. When you put two women in a relationship, you know... Very few relationships can handle that kind of relational intensity. That's why you have more domestic violence in lesbian relationships, and that's well established, and it's why you have a higher breakup rate, because mm. there's a female nature, more relationally intense, there's a male nature, more sexually explorative, and those are just undeniably the natures of these different relationships. But men and women coming together, they balance each other out, and they check each other. And 
that is important, and that's why those marriages um, are, are much more likely to work. And when you talked about when the man and the woman come together, there's something, I think you even used the word magical, yeah. going on. And I, I can't but think that I've got a book here. It's been by a pastor and his wife, and I've never used this in a debate but I've been tempted to many times. So he says, if an atheist ever comes to you and asks, why should you believe God exists? You just need to answer one word, sex. Give him time to think about it. And if he comes back at the end of the day, he's not convinced. He's told you a lot more about his sex life than anything else. And the more I think about it, it's, there is a lot of truth that there is something unique in the marriage act. Yes, yes. And it, and I love that point. And, and Nick, I... I say as well, ask the person to explain love to you, ask the person to explain laughter to you. Mm -hmm. So if the naturalist says, well, sex is special because it is a physical stimulation of nerve endings and blah, 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 you know, you're like, okay, tell your wife that. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, there is something inexplicable um, that you just can't reduce down to a naturalistic, mechanistic sort of explanation. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Francis Schaeffer talked about that. He talked about, um, you know, back when you had to go across the ocean on steamships. Um, he was on a steamship. He and Edith were, were traveling. And he met a young man who was an atheist, a philosophy student, and he had just gotten married, and he was on his honeymoon. And, you know, the guy said, there's no real meaning in the world there, you know. And he said, now, when you go back to your cabin and you hug your beautiful wife, mm -hmm. do you really think that she is not there as a human being? Mm -hmm. Schaefer said, he knew the implications of my question. And Schaefer <laughs> had this great phrase. He said, and he walked away silently and sad into the night. Mm-hmm. Schaefer was saying exactly what you're saying, that there is this magic, yeah. this inexplicable communication, if you will, that happens between man and woman, husband and wife, that happens in no other relationship. And that's different than companionship. <laughs> yeah. Well, when we talk about what makes a marriage awesome, I mean, I'm tempted to usually say, you know, the marriage act which is kind of amusing, let's call that, is what does it, that when the couple are sexually involved, they have a marriage. And biblically, that seems to be what takes place in the Bible, right? when the man and woman come together, they're considered married. But what about those couples that, for whatever reason, have a hard time completing the act? Yeah. Sometimes it can take a while. I'm thinking about the book, for instance, The Unveiled Wife. They weren't able to have sex for four years after they were married. What about yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and in that sense, um, it is sex that brings them together. When, when we talk about the marital act, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be frank about it, it is not just because there is this physical stimulation between, you know, the part of a male body and a female body. That's part of it, but there's a deeper communion there. And, right. you know, it is the norm, it is the desire. Um, you, you don't have any married couple, you know, who talking to their friends and, you know, they say, well, you know, how is your sex life? There is no married couple that has ever said, you know what, we've never bothered to be interested in it. We're just not interested in that. You know, it is the human nature to be interested. Mm -hmm. Now, you said if there is a technical, physical kind of problem, it doesn't mean that technically they are not married or that they have not, if you will, consummated their marriage, even though right. technically they haven't. It's the, there are other kind of intimacies that can happen there. I mean, right. they have become intimate with one another mm -hmm. as much as they possibly can. Right. That is an intimacy that belongs in no other relationship. Yeah, and I'm thinking even if you don't have technical problems, I mean, on on our wedding day, we got married, and it was a few hours before we got back to the hotel. We got back to our hotel room. I shouldn't say got back. We got to our hotel room together, and yet we were still fully married 
the whole time. Right. So, although I, I, I would say I definitely want to get out of that reception very quickly. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I have been interested in this, Nick, that if we could write a book um, and research a book asking couples about their first time together, uh-huh. I think it usually turns out more horribly than they expect that it will. One, right. because they're exhausted, they're nervous, mm-hmm. they're anxious, you know, yeah. and it usually just happens later when they can relax. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, to, <laughs> to just be very honest, that's how it was with my wife and I. And, you know, so it's, it's even in that union coming together, very seldom does it work out, you know, so wonderfully and the coming together of husband and wife and, and things like that. So if we think that that is technically the, you know, the kind of consummation of the wedding and that's when the marriage really happens, in some ways it's true, but in some ways it's not. Yeah, Kevin Lehman in his book Sheet Music has said that your first time normally won't shoot you to the moon and back. <laughs> and, I mean, I know that the first time, when you talk about being sleep deprived, I had even taken an Ambien the night before to make sure I'd sleep, and I got about an hour sleeping the yeah. day before the wedding, because, I mean, and... Allie, we've got a picture of her drinking a five-hour energy thing at the wedding, <laughs> <laughs> because that's just what happens. And at the same time, though, I try and give this kind of advice, because I had some men who were advising me before I got married, because no one really wants to go up to their dad and say, hey, how do I do this exactly? <laughs> and so I, I found other men who were willing to give me advice, and yeah. I give men the same kind of advice now, and, and just always tell them, just let things go. And don't make too much of a big deal about things because, you know what, you're not going to do your best the first time, but you have the rest of your lives to exactly. practice together. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. And just just enjoy one another, you mm-hmm. know. And that's the other thing is the man and wife are in different places, right. you know. And be patient with your wife, encourage her to be patient with you, mm-hmm. um, and you know what, just the thing is is try to concentrate on each other, um, and try to be gentle, and you know what, it, again, uh, it's funny, we had um, our pediatrician one time told us, one of our kids was, you know, kind of late being diaper trained, he goes, you know what, I don't know any kid that has shown up to kindergarten with diapers, you know, of course the message was, It'll take care of itself, you know. Right. It'll be fine. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, there's there's no married couple or very few. I mean, who like okay, it is just simply not working, and it has never been able to work, you know, beyond like 24 hours. Um, it it comes together, and that has to do with again God's design, God's nature. Mm-hmm. He made men and women, um, you know, to wanna be able and try to work that out. And that's a human universal. Mm-hmm. Well, to return to the SCOTUS ruling a little bit, because, I mean, I'd like to, to talk about that a lot in the first time, and in the second I'll talk about the difference marriage makes. I mean, what can Christians do now who are so concerned about this? I mean, some of them might be saying, well, guys, we've lost this battle, let's pack it up and go home. I mean, what yeah. should we do? Well, first of all, and, and the other side would like for us to know that. And in fact, at Focus on the Family, mm-hmm. you know, we would get calls from the New York Times and, you know, big media places. And they're like, so are you guys going to concede? Are you going to get in line? Are you going to support same-sex marriage? And we said, and many others have said it, this decision no more settles this issue then Roe v. Wade settled the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. And the great irony there is, I mean, my goodness, it threw gas on that issue. And that's going to be the same with us. And it's interesting because journalists get that, you know. Okay, nobody, you know, um, you know, just said, oh, my goodness, okay, you know, this this abortion issue is done. Um, the marriage issue is not done. The mm-hmm. debate continues because the experiment, it is an experiment. It is a radical social experiment that we are conducting 
with this coming generation of children and this coming generation of adults mm. um, sex and you know what we're going to see how it works out and it is not going to work out well we just know again because like what you said earlier natural law we know natural law and it you know we may try to redefine it we may try to spin it um, but it's like a ball that you you know pull underwater in the pool it's going to pop right back up to the top and and you know this is this is not the decisive decision. Um, so that's we need to realize that first of all in the church. But I think the second thing that we need to do is the church needs to be a place where we teach and talk about what marriage is. Right. Primarily as a relationship between the husband and the wife, but also what it means in the biblical story. I mean we will tend to, what does the Bible say about marriage? We'll tend to think about that as advice for the couple. But what does the Bible say about marriage? The whole story is about a groom whose horribly faithless bride has just embarrassed him because of her infidelity and that he has been moving to win her back to himself even putting himself to death. And if you will, the cross itself is a wedding invitation. Are mm-hmm. you going to come to the great wedding feast in Revelation, or are you not? Mm-hmm. And it's the gospel. And so the church needs to teach that. And the church, the scriptures do teach that male and female matter, um, because Christ is the male. He is the bridegroom. We are the bride herself who is going to receive I mean think about that physically intimately receive the life and the gift of the husband now of course it's not physically sexual but that imagery is very very um, relevant Mm -hmm. when you were talking about that I was giving thanks that our church after this decision we decide in October we're going to take some time to prepare we're going to have a series not a sermon series this is going to be a series outside of a sermon on sex and sexuality and marriage and oh. the pastor's already told me hey I want to pick your brain on some of this which uh, I'm more than happy to contribute and at the same time we're talking about whatever Christians can do something I've done and I think I have a Christian shirt and you can see if you agree with this is I've started an organization here right now I'm just a just a Facebook group and such but for Christians in my city to come together or even non-Christians if they share the same goals to talk about the freedoms that we Christians have and how we want to defend them and learn about them because there are people out there like you and say Robert Gagnon and Michael Brown and others who are out there doing the debates and doing research and such but same time, if we make the battle entirely dependent on you and everyone else, <laughs> then we're 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 not going to succeed because that's not a burden you all can carry. But it needs to be a grassroots movement, you know, kind of like the Tea Party was. If ordinary yeah. people come together and do things, they can really do things. Yeah. And and the church, I mean, you know. The, the handful of us that are fighting this, and, and you know, you as well, mm-hmm. we are not the church. You mm-hmm. know, we are a part of the church, but the church needs to communicate this and preach this and demonstrate this and show this. And it breaks my heart, Nick, and, and we see it all too often, is, you know, quote-unquote good evangelical pastors and leaders that are just capitulating on this issue oh, gosh. and and giving into it. Listen to what they say, though. They do not give you theological or biblical reasons. It's, it's sentimentality mm-hmm. and it's niceness. We just want to be nice. Mm-hmm. Well, you can be nice to people, love them, and disagree. Right. You know, one of the ways I also think we've failed in the church is our message has largely been negative, negative, negative. And the key example I have of this is I remember being a college guy before I got married, and I was in Bible college at the time, but 
the church I was attending, then they were having a silver ring thing service. Mm -hmm. which, if people don't know, that's about waiting until you're married to have sex. And the, the associate pastor got up and he gave a talk. And he was saying, you know, if you have sex before you get married, it is going to be for selfish reasons. I mean, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can agree with that. And he said, but instead of this, what you need to think about, you could get a disease. You could get pregnant. Think about the shame you're going to experience. Think about what you're going to have to tell your future spouse one day. And I was listening to that and I was saying, um, Pastor, I tell you, but those sound like pretty selfish reasons to me, too. <laughs> and the more he kept going on and on about this topic, I was getting bored sitting out in the audience. And I tell people, if you are a, in ministry and you are teaching about sex, and the college guy in your audience is getting bored, you are doing <laughs> something wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's it, is we don't, I mean, you know, essentially, Nick, is the evangelical church has two messages on sexuality. One is, prior to marriage, don't do it. And after marriage, be skilled at it. You know, we have yeah. abstinence books, and then we have marriage manuals and sex tip books. Right. And really beyond that, I mean, there is not, and, you know, I'd be interested in your thoughts being, you know, being a theology student. Do you know of a book that is a good theology and uh, a good theology of sexuality? Honestly, Peter Crave said years ago in his book, The God Who Loves Us, what we really need is a theology of sex. And honestly, I would like to be one of the people who writes that book. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's needed. It's needed. Um, I would say you mentioned pre Peter Kreeft. Um, you know, as a Catholic, there is, you know, for him, the Catholics have that. Yeah. And I would encourage anybody. There's a wonderful book, and it's a it's a it's a, a, a body of work that Pope John Paul wrote long before he was pope, and it's called um, it's called generally theology of the body. But you mm -hmm. can look it up, and it's um, called male and female. He created them, mm -hmm. but it is a wonderful, even for evangelicals, a wonderful theology and heavily biblical theology of, and it's not just about sexuality, it really is a theology of being human, and he starts there, and then he addresses sexuality, mm -hmm. and it is, it is wonderful, but the evangelicals, I mean, we don't really have that, and we do need that. Yeah. When you were talking about the two things that we learn, I was thinking about two different things, because the usual joke that gets told is that Christians were growing up were told two things about sex. Number one, sex is dirty. Number two, save it for someone you love. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know what? I mean, okay, folks, we're smarter than that. Yeah. And you hear stories of women particularly who, you know, grow up in a particular Christian tradition. Yep. And yesterday it was bad, it was ugly, it was sinful, and now tonight I'm, you know, supposed to jump into the deep end of that pool. Right. And they can't make that connection. And, you know, the idea, and this goes back to what you were saying with that pastor at your church. What if the pastor had said, sex is such a beautiful thing, it's such a wonderful thing, it's such a mysterious thing, it is such a sacred thing that you don't dare open it, use it, experience it without the right setting. Right. I like to compare it to something like, say, nuclear energy. It's really good, really awesome if you use it in the right way and can be channeled for great good, but if you misuse sexuality, Chernobyl takes place. You know what? And that is a wonderful and powerful illustration. Yeah. And Chernobyl, I mean, yes, bad things happen. And that goes back to the discussion about marriage and what the secular anthropologists say the number one thing marriage does is it regulates sexuality. Mm -hmm. They understand that nuclear um, illustration, you know? Mm -hmm. If you don't control sexuality, really, really bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. And if you control it, then, you know, wonderfully good things can happen. Not
not just between the people, but for society itself. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to the SCOTUS thing, again, you said that you're, this is kind of like an experiment, but this experiment is not going to work. Why will it not work? Why are you so sure? Well, first of all, I mean, you know, the, kind of the easy answer is because it goes contrary to what God has designed and mm -hmm. contrary to his word. But, but let me back up and, and sort of back that up. Now, in my work that I have been doing at Focus on the Family for the last 25 years, you think about we have seen the most dramatic changes with family in the last 40 to 50 years than all of the previous time in humanity collectively. Okay, first of all, we saw the separation of sex from marriage, the sexual revolution. Right. Then we saw the divorce revolution. You mm -hmm. know, what? people should be able to just leave marriages when they want. We next saw the cohabiting revolution, and we're in the midst of that, and now we're seeing the same-sex revolution. So we should judge each of those things by the fruit that they have produced. The sexual revolution, even the secularists say, we had the sexual revolution and everyone lost. Mm -hmm. Nobody really thinks that the sexual revolution was a great idea. The secular scholars who have studied the last 30 years of divorce they say there is real, in terms of psychological and physical well-being and relational well-being, it has not improved general human well-being. It is the same with the cohabiting revolution. The one that I didn't mention is the fatherless revolution. I mean, every one of those things have harmed human well-being, hmm. but more than anybody anticipated. So, Nick, we come along to today and we say, oh, no, no, but the same-sex revolution, that's going to turn out to be fine. You know, just simply from the track record, we're going to see there's real problems. But here's the big, big problem. You know, your listeners being apologetic um, students, this word ontology, right. the same-sex marriage challenges the ontology of humanity in that it exists this in male and female. Mm -hmm. And when you say that, well, no, male and female don't really matter, from a spiritual point of view, going back to creation, what is it that male and female represent? The verses that we just saw in Genesis 1, male and female mysteriously, wonderfully represent the very image of God in the world. Mm-hmm. When we come upon this and we go, oh, no, 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 male and female, not really that important, and they're not needed for the family, Satan himself, he knows what kind of statement that is. It is challenging and overthrowing the very nature of God displayed in humanity. Mm -hmm. The church, Satan gets that. He knows it. The church needs to get that. We need to understand that. And there is going to be great fallout. You do not challenge the image of God in humanity without, one, great judgment from him, but also the game, the, the you know, human life experience just falling apart. And, you know, that goes back to the Chernobyl thing that mm -hmm. you were mentioning. Um, you can't categorize how negative the fallout is going to be. Yeah, and when we go to the New Testament, we see marriage of male and female as a picture of the gospel. I mean, you change that, you change the gospel somehow. Absolutely, and and that's the thing, Nick. We did a at Focus on the Family. We did a film series. Um, it's it's relatively new out. It's called the Family Project, and it's a a twelve week small group curriculum that looks at a theology of marriage and family and sexuality. And as we were working on the early stages of it, there's a book that goes along with it that I that I wrote in another guy that I think is, I, I'm very proud of it, and I think it does a really good job of offering a theology of these things. But as we were working in the early parts and we were working the theological stuff out, the director of the film series that we were working with, he said, you know what? Satan would be an excellent Sunday school teacher. And what he meant, of course, was, 
Satan gets the story. He knows what all these subtle things mean. Now, he hates them, and he wants to destroy them, but the imagery of marriage and the gospel, he knows what that represents, and that's why he wants to destroy it. And the church, we need to be prophetic and understand those things. Mm-hmm. Well, I like... Yeah, let them uh, know that you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast. Right now, you're listening to Glenn Stanton. We're talking about marriage and what a difference it makes. If you're li- here next week, you're not going to hear anything because I'm going to not be doing a show. I had canceled any events for that Saturday because on this upcoming Friday, my wife and I are going to be celebrating five years together and... I wasn't sure what we would be doing, so I wasn't taking any chances. So you're not going to be hearing anything. But on August 1st, we're going to have Dee Dee Warren come back. Now, she was back here in January when we talked about abortion. And she's going to be on the show again talking about eschatology this time. One of my favorite topics, too, with her new book, It's Not the End of a World. It's going to be a look at Matthew 24 and what's really going on in that passage. So if you're interested in eschatology, come back here on August 1st to hear D.D. Warren. But for now, we're going to get back to Glenn Stanton talking about marriage. Now, then I was looking on Facebook today, and I saw one of my friends, who's a non-Christian, talking about a lady in his life and saying, Today is moving in together day. Now, you know, this, this makes so much sense to so many people. I mean, marriages, they fall apart sadly so often divorce rate is greater so why not just test it out you know see how well it works and besides uh, why why would you buy a car if you didn't take it for a test drive Mm -hmm. doesn't Mm -hmm. this make sense well it it does make a certain type of sense Mm -hmm. if we were talking about a relationship being a car right computer, you know, Mm -hmm. but no, relationships are different. Think about this, you know, ladies listening, okay, your guy comes to you and he says, I am not really sure that I want to commit to you. Can I just, you know, can I just try you out a bit and see, and you know, ladies, your heart just swoons, but Mm -hmm, that is, well, yeah, that's what cohabitation is about. Now, the book that you mentioned at the at the top of the show, I, I wrote that with Moody about two years ago, and it's called The Ring Makes All the Difference, mm-hmm. and it talks about how cohabitation and marriage are two very different things. Mm-hmm. I do not address it from a theological point of view. There's a chapter in the back where I address that, but it is primarily looking at the mainstream social science from leading sociologists, and there is literally... It's hard to say this in the social science, but there is literally no research whatsoever that says that cohabitation has a positive impact on any relationship. Mm -hmm. Cohabiting, moving in together without rings on your fingers, tends to hurt the relationship itself, Mm -hmm. and it tends to hurt the two people joining in on that relationship and the children that are involved. I mean, that is remarkable to think about. Well, don't you want to test drive something itself? If you were interested in buying a car and the test drive itself ruined or made that car less effective, you would not do that. That is exactly what happens with cohabitation. And, you know, for young people who go, oh, no, that's ridiculous. I challenge them, go to the scientific literature and find any study that shows any positive consequence of moving in together in marriage rather than marrying. And they won't find anything. I've looked for it. It doesn't exist. I like what uh, Jennifer Roback Morris of the Roof Institute says in her book, Smart Sex. She says, question I could ask these people is, which one of you is a driver and which one of you is the car? Mm, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's the thing is the objectification of the woman. Right. You know? now, now, Nick, another thing that I talk about in the book, sociologists have done this research. They took large populations of cohabiting couples and they divided the men up into a group and the women up into a group. 
And here's what they found. They said that one group relatively consistently said one thing about the relationship. They asked them. They divided them up, men and women, and they asked them, where do you see your relationship growing? One group was more likely to say, you know what, we're just having fun, hanging out, seeing what happens. One, the other group was more likely to say, you know what, we're on the road to getting married. We're, you know, we've got it in our future, and we're just kind of waiting for the right time. Mm -hmm. And they didn't expect this, but that's what they found time and time and time again. Now, you know, you put on your best non-gender stereotypical hat and just guess just take a flying <laughs> guess you know which group said which um geez i'm going to guess the men were more interested in just having fun and a good time and the women were interested in marriage you must have read the study you must nope. have your hope with but what that says in in terms of i mean the feminists have thought that Cohabitation is an empowering thing to the women. But no. think about this. This means that those women are having false expectations. They think the relationship is going one way, and the men have no interest in that whatsoever. And it, I promise myself I would not use the milk and the cow analogy that our grandparents told us. But that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Gals? If you give your husband, this guy, what he's looking for, he's not going to be interested in going any farther in that relationship. And it shows itself out in that secular research. I, I think the question, I think it, it was Regnoris who, I might, I might not be remembering the name, I'm sure you can tell me, but I heard him give a talk somewhere, and he said, the question that women have to ask is, what are you worth? Are you worth yeah. dinner and a movie? Are you worth a week, a month, six months, a year, engagement, marriage, what? And he said, now you other women up there, if any other woman sets herself up as being worth less than marriage, that woman is your enemy because she is making yeah. it all the harder for you to find someone. That, you're exactly right. That That is Mark Regnerus. Um, mm -hmm. He is a, a very, very dear friend, and it's what he talks about is the economics of sexuality. Right. That is exactly right. Women have a good that they can bring to market, mm -hmm. and it's their sexuality. And men will pay a very high price for it. Yeah. But, unfortunately, with the hookup culture, you know, there are women just giving it away. I mean, you mm -hmm. think about that, okay, gas, you know, you have, you've set your price high for gas, but there's mm -hmm. a gas station down the street where they're giving it away and a free big gulp, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that woman, that gas station who is undercutting the price, she is ruining it for everybody. Mm -hmm. That is another thing of what marriage has done. Mm -hmm. It has said women are setting the price there. Now think about that. He, I mean, he says this, and this is fascinating. He says a woman's sexuality is more valuable at a market level than male sexuality. Mm -hmm. When I first heard that, I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And, and I explain it to audiences this way. A woman gets up on a stage at any university and says, you know what, I'm available sexually for any man who will have me. How many customers, if you will, will she get? They'll be now, lining up constantly. Yeah. You have a man who stands up on that university stage and says, ladies, I am available to anybody. I'll be, you know, back in the back room. You just come see me. There may be some women who come see him, but the, all the other women are going to have a view of her. But it's right. not going to be very... A man can't give his sexuality away, you know? Um, it doesn't have that high a market price, but mm -hmm. women do. Women control mm -hmm. the marketplace of sexuality. And anthropologists tell us that. Margaret Mead teaches about that in her work that it's the woman who is the gatekeeper of sexuality. If she says no, then the word is no to the man. And there is no culture anywhere 
where a man is awarded or rewarded for just going in and taking sexuality from a woman by his sheer will. Every place that is called rape. Right. And that's interesting. That is a big, big thing. Yeah. I like to tell women, I don't say, women, you do not really realize so much the great power you have over your husbands in this issue. You can make them and you can break them on this issue. And when I see them, I say, and they tell me things like, well, geez, if my husband would help me out with vacuuming or if he would help me out with the kids or if he would help do the laundry, I say, look, now, here, try this experiment. Seduce your husband like crazy. Be as romantic <laughs> with him as you can. And I guarantee you, give it a week or two, he will be begging for that vacuum cleaner. <laughs> you know, and, and that is exactly it. And that's mm -hmm. the irony of the feminist movement. Mm -hmm. You know, it is the wife that is the most powerful person in the universe mm -hmm. and you think well no politicians and you know things like that you know what the most powerful politician in the world only exists because some woman somewhere said yes to a man's advances right. yes um, women and their right to say yes or no to a man the green light or the red light sexually she is the most powerful player in the world. Mm -hmm. yep. So why is it then that this matters so much more? What is it about the whole sexual thing that really makes all the difference? Well, it's, it's really the sexual thing, but it's the context, right. too, right? Mm -hmm. It's... Um, you know, C.S. Lewis said that. He said um, that he, he called it the atrocity. The atrocity of marriage, sex outside of marriage is it's, it, it separates or divorces one thing from all the other relationships that are meant to go along with it. Mm -hmm. Sexuality needs to be protected. It mm -hmm. needs to be cared for. It needs a hedge of protection around it to care for it, to isolate it, um, and that is marriage. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, we know that, and this is fascinating, that, that you know, some of the best sociological research tells us that marital sexual fulfillment is better within marriage than it is in cohabiting relationships, mm -hmm. dating relationships, and even just casual hookup relationships. Because when this thing is protected and people grow together in their comfort and they know that, okay, this person isn't going to be leaving tomorrow, right. uh, that creates a comfort and a confidence that allows both male and female, man and woman, to really invest in one another mm -hmm. and have a happier relationship. And marriage does that. No other relationship can do that. In Something unusual also with the homosexual union is I've heard this said before and I can agree with it that if it really wasn't for sex, men would never get married. Yes. Absolutely. And that's, and that's right. And, um, you know, because they have no interest in it. They have, you know, they have nothing to gain. And that again shows the power of the woman. Mm -hmm. Um, because again, they will always find women in the market who are willing to give what they are seeking mm -hmm. way at a lower price. Mm -hmm. Now, then some women could be up here listening and saying, are, are you saying then that all men are interested in is just sex, they're not interested in a woman? Well, you, you think, this is the way that I explain this. Uh -huh. There is a basic male nature, mm -hmm. and the basic male nature is not inclined to want to be interested in the woman as a woman, you know, as much as a sexual object. But then there is a refined, there's the civilized, I mean, you know, you think of the other as the sort of Lord of the Flies arena. Mm -hmm. There are... Um, men who they don't want to be animalistic 
you know, they want to be a little more refined. Um, and so they will go and get married. But those men are typically rare. Right. And, you know, there are men that, you know, will want to enter marriage. But, but marriage has to be socially expected and enforced because there are many, many men who, you know, would not pick it. They would not desire it when they can get, I mean, you know, the, 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 the basic male nature, and you tell ladies this, you know what, you feed him relatively warm food on a regular basis and give him access to sex and maybe be quiet during the football game, you know what, your guy's going to be satisfied with the relationship. I mean, men yep. just have very low expectations. Women have very high expectations. And for most of the problems that couples have in marriage, it's, you know, it's the distinction there. So what you're saying is true, but it's not true, if you will, of, of all men, because there are these other factors. You know, when you talked about how uh, men have low expectations, I can't help but think of some of uh, the jokes that I've still heard in the past that, for instance, when it comes to getting your husband a gift on his anniversary, your birthday, or anything like that, you will never get a return receipt on sex, no no matter what. Yep. And that uh, the, the old jokes I'm saying also that sex is like pizza. Bad pizza is good pizza. It is good <laughs> no matter what. It's, it's good even when it's bad. Yes. Which, the other thing is, you know what? Take them to the buffet, too. You know, it's not <laughs> like, okay, I'm returning this. Um, he may be a little disappointed that that's all that there was, but the thing itself, yeah, he's he's not going to complain. And you're right. And it takes it takes more to satisfy a woman sexually because she is, you know, she is more sophisticated sexually, if you will, mm -hmm. than the man. And it sounds, you know, like we're male bashing here, but they are different sexual creatures. Mm -hmm. And you know, the man is the one that really is enhanced um, when he is married and he has to satisfy the woman. The other thing, Nick, that I like to say is manners in society only exist because women exist. Right. right. You know, you wouldn't have a bunch of men on an island, you know, saying, let's, let's use cloth napkins and, you know, mm -hmm. let's... Um, ask nicely at the table, you know, yeah. for the food and things like that. Yeah, if, if I was men, if I was men, yeah, if I was men together, if one of them just belches suddenly, the others don't say, "Oh, you should be say excuse me," but it, it, it'll become a competition as to who can do the loudest one then. <laughs> exactly, and that is the male nature. And women, again, women socialize and domesticate men, mm -hmm. and that is why. Um, Marriage, you know, that's one of the other reasons why it matters, because every society needs to learn how do we settle down um, the, the, the male part of the species. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I can't but think that uh, my wife and I both have Asperger's, so mm. that gives us a very unique relationship. And some of that Asperger's that we both have is we are very finicky with what we eat. Mm -hmm. And our tastes are very very different and before I got married to my wife I'd have some pizza every night believe it or not I'm underweight actually mm -hmm. but I'd, ha I'd get one of the store I'd break it up into quarters and I'd have some for dinner every night practically mm -hmm. and I got married and things started changing for instance having my gallbladder taken out suddenly that had a lot to do with things wow. but uh, I, I realized I need to make some changes in my diet, especially since I wanted my wife to make those exact same kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. And so I like to tell people that, yeah, years of counseling and talking to my parents and having everyone else come and try and persuade me didn't budge me an inch. Mm -hmm. Then Ari shows up and says, and she doesn't even have to say anything, it's just being her, her being there, I think, yeah, I gotta do do something different. So Allie does in a few months what counselors couldn't do for years. Because I mean, I even told my roommate at the time, who was also my best friend, when I said, "Yeah, I don't keep pizzas in my freezer anymore." Wow. Huh. And 
I've actually added fish products to my diet, and we can go out for Mexican restaurants together. I mean, yeah, there's still work to do, but Ari did all of that. Yeah. And again, that's the power of a woman. Mm -hmm. And she can do it without lifting a finger. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it is remarkable. It is remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, cohabiting women, but cohabiting women mm -hmm. are, uh, this is what I like to say, and, and, you know, folks can write this down. Marriage is the relationship on the woman's terms. Cohabiting is the relationship on the man's terms. Mm -hmm. A wife has more power in a relationship than a woman in a cohabiting relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and women need to know that. Mm -hmm. Um and that's why they're interested in marriage, because a husband becomes a different kind of man that a live-in boyfriend simply cannot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have to remind everyone that you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast, and everything we do here at the show, it's really listener support. I don't pay my guests a cent to come on. I'd love to be able to, but I don't, and I can't. They come on freely. And all the work that we do here, research, writing, things like that, that is made so much easier by your support. Now, if you're listening to this and you really like this show, you want to help me with doing it, keeping it going, maybe even sometime making it able so it can be live again, so you can call in and talk to the guest. Well, here's how. You go to my website at deeperwaters.ddns.net. Now, you'll see it, something on the sidebar. It says, Help Support for Work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. And you go there on the link there, and it takes you to Risen Jesus Ministries. Have you gone to the right place? Yes. If you listened to the show last week, you know Mike Lacona, who runs that, is my father-in-law, in fact. And you go and you make the donation there, and then you send an email to me or Mike or Mike's wife, Debbie, and say, Hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. And we will get it, and that donation will be tax-deductible. And if you can especially become a monthly donor, that would mean so much. I mean, some of you, you might be better off with uh, financially than we are, and you can afford to spare something. You won't miss it too much, but it will mean the world to us. And it thrills us so much when people donate, because it means you really support what we do. You can support us through Amazon by buying books that we sell and if you buy books out on the site through us we get some of it you can support us by buying some of the books that I've written or co-written such as Defining Iner Inerrancy or Groundless or one I've solely written on my own A Creed for the Ages A Look at the Apostles Creed and there's also another link on our blog where you can support us through buying jewelry now I'm sure Glenn might have something to say about this as well but you see, if you go to this site and you make a purchase and you contact me or contact Lena Clester who runs them and say, hey, I made a purchase, 25% of your purchase will go to support Deeper Waters. And if, uh, if talking about this has gotten you to the point of saying, hey, I would really love to impress my wife, you know, something that can make a lot of women very responsive to you, believe it or not, can be buying them jewelry. So that, that is a money well invested. You get to support a ministry, and you could get something very special on your own too. Now, Glenn, do you have a do you have any organization you'd like people to be able to support as well? Well, I would I would echo what you're saying, and and really encourage people to support what you do. What what it is, Nick, is it's very I mean it's significant work, and mm -hmm. and you were helping to uh, equip the church. So I would encourage um, mm -hmm. each of your listeners in that to, mm -hmm. you know, to pray and consider um, supporting you, and like you said, you know, even even monthly perhaps. But working at Focus on the Family, um, I, you know, I appreciate that opportunity, Nick, to, to give them a pitch. Focus on the Family is a great organization that is committed to helping families thrive and to thrive in Christ. And you can go to focusonthefamily.com um, and, you know, there's information there about where you could become a, a, a regular partner and, a, you know, join us um, side by side in helping to defend the family. So, yeah, thank you for that, Nick. 
No problem. Now, what, what's the website again? It is focusonthefamily.com. Okay. That'll work. Either, either one works. Mm -hmm. um, and the notion, donations are tax deductible, of course, right? Correct. Uh huh. Now, with what I was just saying also, I mean, let's talk about how that works, too. As I said, you know, if you buy jewelry for your woman, that could work out very, very well. I mean, what kind of difference do things like that make in the marriage on both ends, with the, the man and the woman both contributing? You know, it's, I mean, it's interesting there. And, and my wife is a little different. She is not interested in jewelry, but most right. women are. Right. And, you know, the issue is jewelry, but it's also doing special things. Mm -hmm. um, and I can do a whole heck of a lot better there. But thinking and being intentional about special things that you can do for your wife, mm -hmm. there's the payoff, you yeah. know. Um, she appreciates that. She loves that. She gets what she wants. And you know what? She is more likely um, to be more friendly, um, more open, um, more gracious sexually with you, and even just, you know, relationally. Mm -hmm. uh, those are things, those gifts that you can give back and forth to each other, those, if you will, kind of grease the relationship um, and the interaction between a husband and a wife. Um, you know, I, I like to say there's no woman who said, you know what, my husband just gives me too many gifts and I wish he'd stop. If she, you know, if she literally says that she doesn't want him to stop, mm -hmm. she's just saying, you know what, he's a very gracious man. Yeah. Uh, women, women do not resist that. They love that. And good husbands can be responsive to it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm even thinking that when Ali and I were just, after we were engaged, my mother-in-law put some about uh, her, uh, her husband building a porch for her. She said, my husband spoils me. And I started to my alley, and she said, Mr. Peters is the king of spoiling. But, oh, that, 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 that's wow. so good. Yeah. Uh, what is it that, for instance, why is it that these gifts, these acts of service, or whatever, love languages, we would say, why do they matter so much to a woman? Well, because, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier mm -hmm. with, um, you know, the lesbian side of things. Women are more relationally intense. Mm -hmm. They want a, a man, you know, it has to do with communication. Um, men can communicate in grunts. They can communicate right. in just a tip of the head, right? You know, like, why didn't you guys say hi to each other? You know what? We did. We, we tipped our head to each other. You know, right. and men understand it. Women, they are, they're more relationally, I don't want to even say complex, but, but sophisticated. And there are many different ways that we can uh, be intimate with our wives, if you will, from their perspective, giving gifts, listening to them. I mean, how many times have we as married men said, you know, I don't want you to fix my problem, she says, I just want you to listen to me. And we're like, but if I don't help you fix it, well, good. No, she yeah. just wants you to listen, right. you know and to identify with her. And mm -hmm. that is a wonderful gift. Women are simply more responsive to gifts, gifts of time, gifts of commitment, gifts of help, gifts of listening, um, you know, physical gifts of, um, and they can even be super small things. You know what? I was on my way home from work tonight. I stopped by the grocery store. I got you some flowers just because I thought about you and because you're important. And you know what? Those flowers can be the most miserable flowers. It's the thought, you know? Right. Uh, it's the thought that counts. It's interesting with men. Men don't say that. Right. You know? It, it's, you brought home some, some bad tacos. Well, isn't it the thought? No, the tacos counted. Right. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. uh, and women, women are different that way, and men need to, to know, and I'm still learning, you know, in, in tragic ways. I've been married 33 years. I'm still trying to learn, um, you know, how do you communicate well in that way. Well, let's uh, switch and go to the other end now, because, I mean, before I got married, I mean, yeah, I had desires for sex and such, but it wasn't like, this is so much on my mind 24 
seven and such. And then after I got married, yeah, that that changed rather quickly. And yeah, I, I tell you, yeah, it's men can think of that, and then they get they taste the fruit, they see that it's good, and they just keep wanting more and more of it. Yeah. And, and so since sexuality is what the man primarily wants, because we don't hear stories of men usually saying, "Honey, it's great that you get me all this sex and such," but I really wish you just go and bring me buy me a simple gift at the store. No, men do not speak that way. So, so why is it then that sexuality matters so much to a man? Well, I mean, that, that is a big question. Mm. That's a big question, and yeah. it is one of the mysteries of humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, so one sense, you know, I don't want to throw out, you know, just a couple mm -hmm. of quick questions. That is one of the big human questions and mysteries. But I think it, it, it has to do with, and this is the thing that we need to understand, there is a male nature. Mm -hmm. And men across the board, um, they, they are not as intimate, if you will. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, what was the show probably... 15 years, 20 years ago about um, Tim the Toolman Taylor. Home Improvement. Yeah, Home Improvement. I mean, he'll talk about it, and you'll see this on you know other shows like King of the Hill. You know what? Guys can come around, another guy changing the oil in his car or a belt on his car, and you know what? They'll just talk about it, and they are bonded. They are bonded as much as two men will ever be bonded. You mm -hmm. know, they're... Women... They really have to develop that after a long while. Mm -hmm. So it's it's true. I mean, you know, you think about that. Men can be out hunting. There are things that men can do together that are really simple that really bond them together. And you know, this guy that you meet out hunting or at the bar. You know, he's your new best buddy. Right. Um, the the same is true with sexuality with a man. Mm -hmm. He's very easy to please in a sense but the also is is the physical nature of a man you know in the physical act um it is a, a very satisfying experience and it's a very important experience amen the other is he loves to hold a woman in his arms oh, and yeah. he does love to hold his wife you mm. ask men you know, where are they most satisfied? Where it's, you know what, this woman that is a part of my life, this woman that I can depend on, this woman, you know, that that is always there for mm -hmm. me. Um, and that's that's critical. Yeah. When you talk about how uh, men and women approach it differently, I mean, one thing that I think we usually forget is that women, they require a whole lot of warm-up time. I mean, if a woman is going to plan an evening for her husband, one woman I know of even wrote T.S. on her calendar, so she could be having fake sex the whole time, so that when it got to the time, she'd be ready. Now, wow. for we men, it could be, I could be, say, sitting in my living room, being engrossed in a really good book that I'm studying at the time, and then I could come in, just give me a good kiss and say, hey, how's Jack go to the bedroom and have some fun with me? Okay, I am ready. I am interested immediately. It takes no time whatsoever for a man. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I mean, that's exactly right. It has been said, you know, that, that um, a woman is more of a crock pot, a slow cooker. A man is more of a microwave. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, Nick, you were, were talking about that. I have, um, I, I read The New Yorker, mm -hmm. and I love their cartoons, and sometimes, you know, for a sophisticated New York cosmopolitan magazine, they nail a lot of this stuff, and I will cut some of these cartoons out. There's one cartoon, it's a man and woman in bed, and, you know, they're just waking up, he's got, like, you know, whiskers and stuff, and she is saying to him, how would you like it if I woke you up every morning looking for sex? You know, and it's, it's what that is communicating is the clear understanding that we recognize that men and women are different, you know, and that's the ridiculousness of the joke because, yeah, you know what? 
I'd be quite fine with that. You know, I, I was sitting here and I heard that and I just got the biggest smile on my face and I was going to say, <laughs> you promise? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, we, we know and it doesn't depend on politics or religion or faith or even cultural. It's not like, well, that's true of men in some parts of the world and not true of men in other parts. Um, so... Yeah. Um, I think part of it also is that men tend to be very social creatures in the sense that we get our identity from people around us. That a man will often do the craziest, stupidest thing you can imagine, just so another guy out there will be looking at him and say, You the man! at that point. <laughs> and that all that affirmation from other men in the world, it doesn't matter a thing if he doesn't have the affirmation from his wife. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, and that's exactly right. And if women knew, you know, the... And, and nearly every married man is this way. Right. I can do anything if I have all the criticism from all the men. Right. But if I get criticism from you, mm -hmm. I could not lift a toothpick, right. you know? But if I get encouragement from you, I can lift and move the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I like to tell people, I say, look, I consider myself to be a very rational person. I mean, Dr. Spock could practically be my role model in many ways. And I, I say, I, not even as a Trekkie, but just because that's the best example I can think of that. To you. When it comes to the possibility of even getting to have sex there, uh -huh. All rationality goes right out the window at that point. I mean, a man would do the most bizarre things at that point just for the possibility. And you know what? They do, don't they? They do. <laughs> Actually, we can't say they do. We think we'd be more accurate to say we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, that's where marriage as a social institution, mm -hmm. it, it gets men... And, and challenges them and encourages them to act more like rational beings. Right. Um, and again, that's where, I mean, again, that's what marriage does. That's what monogamy does um, for men. And the more monogamous a culture is, the more enjoyable and productive and socially positive the men are going to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, marriage does serve that purpose. Again, it goes back to what I've, I've mentioned a few times that the secular um, anthropologists say. Marriage regulates sexuality, and women need it to be regulated in terms of, you know, when they get pregnant, they need the man to be around there to help them with these new responsibilities. And men need it regulated in order to settle them down and, and make them not as, um, you know, sexually aggressive, sexual opportunistic, and objectifying women as well. Yeah. Even uh, William Lane Craig, he got a question once reasonable faith asking marriage advice. And I've poured this up from time to time, and, it said, and he said, women, here's one thing you're right, you're husbands will need from you. Wild, passionate, frequent sex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every once in a while, yep. Yeah. And there was also a, a scene I've like from the, when Steve Harvey hosting The Family Feud and he, there was a question that 100 married men fill in the blank. I would blank for sex. <laughs> and it, it, it was just a hysterical episode because the first guy ring in and got the number one answer and that was pay and oh Steve no goes, Steve goes over and says, has a sad sad statement about married men sad yeah. sad and so completely true yeah <laughs> yeah every time a woman came up they'd say something like cook clean they missed the answer when you go back to the guys I would lie for sex I would beg for sex, and then my favorite one came out and said, I would kill for sex, wow. and then the only last answer left was, I would die for sex, and I, I have to agree with what Steve Harvey said, you women, you don't know how deep this runs with us, I mean, you would do all of this. 
And you know what? I mean, that's a game show, but it's brilliant, and it demonstrated right there, like few other things could, the difference between men and women and sex. Now, you bringing um, Family Feud and Steve Harvey up, little fun thing, go on and find the episode where um, the first thing was words that start with pork. Yeah. And one of the guys says, you pine. Yes. <laughs> and Steve Harvey is hilarious with that guy. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I've watched quite a few clips. I mean, the thing is that uh, it, it, it's all true. And I remember <clears throat> talking with someone about it. He said, you know, when my wife and I watch it, yeah, we noticed that the men were talking about all the things that they would be willing to do. But yep. the wives... The women that they were answering, they were get telling what they would like to have done for them exactly. in order to give. And that is a marital secret, mm-hmm. you know, of if you can understand that about your wife, about your woman, um, that that will will take you a long way. The other, though, for husbands and men is to realize that your appetite, your energy is very much different than your wife's. You know what? Sometimes she needs you to be able to run at her speed. Mm -hmm. Um, What I tell married men who are about to get married and getting ready for the wedding night and such, I say, here's my advice for you that night. As slow as possible. Let her set the pace. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, that goes back, men and women are different. Mm -hmm. And as much as a man will realize that, the better off he'll be. But Mm -hmm. women need to realize it as well as, you know, Mm -hmm. um, okay, my husband doesn't have the need and the interest to talk about things sometimes as much as I do. You know what? A husband should be there, Mm -hmm. but he also needs to realize, okay, He's not really connecting with me, not because he doesn't care for me, not because he's not interested, but he's just not likely, as likely, to be wired that way. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the wonderful things about marriage being a relationship that brings men and women together. It calls them and requires them to be sensitive to Mm -hmm. the other person as a male or a female. Yeah, I think for my time, marriage has definitely changed me in many, many ways that I'm having to learn a lot more about forgiveness and things like that. I remember working somewhere, I was a cashier, and uh, this girl who worked with me came up to me and she said, Nick, you seem like a very wise person, everything you say and such around here. If uh, you're wanting to learn forgiveness, what's the number one way you would do it? I said, get married. You would yeah. spend most of your time <clears throat> either giving it or receiving it. And I've spent most of mine receiving it. And eventually we kept talking about this. And after a while I just said, okay, what's his name? Said, How did you know? It is always about a man if you want to learn forgiveness like that. Wow. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, and and that... Um, not only because that's the place where you're going to have the situation where you need to either forgive or ask forgiveness, but it's the place where you're going to care and be motivated to get mm-hmm. it. Yeah. You know, there are other relationships where, you know, maybe sometimes at work, like, you know what, I want to keep my job. Mm-hmm. But there are so many other situations where you're like, you know what, I ain't apologizing, and if you want to make a big deal about it, see ya. You can't do that in marriage, you know. This is the person that I have to create and keep a life with, and I better humble myself. I have such a hard time doing that with my wife and doing it in the way that she needs me to do it. Mm -hmm. But humble yourself and say, you know what, I've got nothing to fight for. I've got nothing to defend myself on. Um, you're, You're absolutely right. And women... Women typically will respond to that kind of humility. Yep. And I think you got into something <clears throat> there that needs to be said that men and women both need to motivate each other. That 
and it has to be both of you seeking to give as much as you can that I mean women if you want your man to do something you have to motivate him sexually but it, it's just not going to work most any other way I mean you can do several other things you would appreciate but if the number one thing isn't being done it's not going to be enough no matter what but and then, know, there I mean there are other things for a man yeah. and one of them is for her to believe in you. Yeah. You know what? I I believe in you. I mm. believe you can do anything. A man as well, if, um, you know, whatever he might do, um, cut the grass, wash the car, do something, if the woman will say, you know what, the yard really, really looks good, there is something within a man that, you know what, I will cut the grass again next Saturday to try to get that kind of Pavlovian response. Um, men want that. Men mm. need that. And that's, you know, that, that issue of respect. And many, many times they don't get it out in the world. And they, they need it, not because they're insecure. You know, many women, oh, you just need to be more secure. You know what? Men need that. And boys need that. Right. Little boys need that from their dads. You know, one aspect of this I was thinking of is that women unknowingly, I think many times, can kill their husbands with some criticism that they don't even realize is criticism. But if yeah. your husband goes and does something special, you like washes the dishes and say, oh, there are smudges on me. Don't you know you're supposed to do this first? And oh, such, yeah. I mean, the man is immediately going to be saying, forget me ever doing this again. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know what? It's the batter in the batter's box. You know what? If I'm going to get beamed by the ball, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do it again. And, mm -hmm. and that is so right. And it's not that the woman can't correct him, but you know what? Don't lead with that. And right. you know, we think, well, men are so strong. Men are strong. But they, in many ways, are more emotionally fragile in different ways than the women can be. Oftentimes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's very important. That's very important for, for wives to understand and know. Now, you know, they don't have to be the one to, like, always say positive things. But, you know, find here and there, you know, if something really impresses you, um, you know, mention that. Um, and, and that, it's cheap, it's easy, but the value that that will give to your husband is, is tremendous. You know, when you talk about how those words can damage a husband so much, one analogy I've used is I've grown up being a gamer all my life. Mm -hmm. And I think about, for instance, The Legend of Zelda has been one of my favorite series. And you can have the hero Link be fighting this monster who's this boss of this dungeon. He's this big, powerful, well-defended creature. And then you do something that can expose a weakness and you just hammer away at that weakness and you just watch the creature just reel back and forth and such and I say yeah um, wives we're like that we are, yeah. we are strong and powerful but you can find our weak spots there and you can yeah. keep hammering hammering and you will eventually kill us if you hammer us that much mm -hmm. and a lot of that oftentimes comes through criticism mm -hmm. you always do this you never do that Mm -hmm. Um, and that, I mean, it is, it is remarkable how powerfully negative that can be. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you, you think about there's, there's these moves that policemen do real simple to subdue somebody who's aggressive. They're physical, you know, just grab their wrist and twist it. Um, those, there are those things within marriage that take no energy from the woman, from the wife. And she can do them, and she can either greatly motivate or greatly limit and, you know, just shut the husband down in, in an emotional way. And husbands and wives need to be able to talk about those things. Yes. You know, it's, it's – and I think that's key to say, you know what, what do you need? What makes you happy? Yeah. Um, and listen, listen to the other person. The wife listened to the husband. The husband listens to the wife. I tell you what, confession in my relationship with my wife is I tend to think she will respond positively to the things that I like, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And she not. This thing, you know, this particular thing is great. 
rather than me listening to, okay, what is it that she wants, you mm. know? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking right now that about how you talk about how the little things a woman can do can motivate a husband. When I live in Charlotte, we went up to an area in the northwest, uh, North Carolina, northeast Tennessee called Cherokee, and we were invited to give a little apologetics conference. And normally, Allie goes with me to all of these because I don't like being without her at these events. I yeah. don't function as well because with me and my social problems, she is there to be the corrective for them. And <clears throat> she was having some back problems and such that day. And so when I started giving my talk, which is ironically on the apologetics of love and marriage, she wasn't in there, but you know, I'm functioning, I'm up there, I'm giving my talk, and then I'm watching the audience and I see the door open, and Audi walks in with a friend of hers who's helped her get over there, uh -huh. and my smile on my face, I cannot hide it at that point, I am in a much better mood, and I am much more capable of speaking. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and you know what? In that sense, if your wife is sitting there and she's kind of scowling, right. she may have stomach pains, you know? Yeah. She's there scowling or she kind of shakes her head like, I mm. can't. It will shut you down, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and that's true. That's true of me. Yeah. Uh, another case also, I'm... Um Thing of that shows things from a different perspective is I watch what my wife does on Facebook closely because people can be jerks on Facebook. I know that's a shock to a lot of people out there, but they can be jerks on Facebook. So she puts up this thing about Bruce Jenner on there, uh -huh. and someone goes after her, and they call her something that I am not going to repeat on the air here. And the only word I can use to describe it is rage at that yeah. point. I mean, it is... If you want to tick me off more than anything else, you insult Allie, and my claws are coming out, and I am not holding back. And like I say, God have mercy on you, because I sure will not. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's, that's the thing that women generally need and want is protection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my wife. You know, she is a strong woman. And I, you know, I've told her, like, Jackie, there ain't nobody that you need. I mean, you can take care of yourself. But she wants to be protected. She mm -hmm. wants to be cared for. She wants for the, you know, man, the me. And, you know, same with your wife in this situation. She, you know, she's like, she could say, I, I can take care of myself, my, myself on Facebook. Um, but when you come and you just say, you know what, nope, nobody does that to my wife, mm. that's going to say, uh, you know, everything to her. Yeah. And speaking of Facebook also, what I tell people about Facebook is, <clears throat> if you want to show world good marriage, make your Facebook page scissor. I go, I, I don't go oh, on Facebook on Sundays, but every other day, I post something for my wife on oh. Facebook every single day and I remember even uh, I took Allie to a women's event at our church it was a kind of a brunch meeting and she can't drive so I have to stay there the whole time and I'm in another room and I can hear the women talking oh. and the pastor intern a female says you know who the cutest couple at our church is it's, it's you and Nick you two are the cutest couple and I see the things he says on Facebook and normally when I see those kind of things I kind of like puke or something internally, but I just like to say, oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> and I'm sitting back there, and I'm hearing something, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> keep going. Exactly. And people see that. And yeah. you know what? Other husbands see it, mm -hmm. and they say, you know what? That's a great idea. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to start doing that same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That doesn't cost you a cent, does Another it? Thing. It just costs you some creative, um, you know, energy to mm. be able to do that. Yeah, and I've even started a group on Facebook, and my wife started a counterpart group for men who are Christian, I mean, who are either married, engaged, dating, or wanting to marry, and she's got a counterpart for women, like I said, and it's all about helping us learn 
how to be good husbands mm. to our wives. Mm-hmm. And it's a place that we can talk, we can share. Everything is said is secret. You can't even find the group if you're looking for it because okay. you have to talk to one of us. And I tell people when we talk about it, I said, our groups are so secret, we don't even know what's going on in each other's groups. We just know <laughs> they exist. Yeah, yeah, yep. And that's and that's good. And, mm-hmm. and to, you know, for men to be able to, to share ideas and frustrations. Right. I don't understand it. I did this. And it just blew up in my face. Right. And, you know, sometimes we as men won't be able to understand it, but there could be older men like, dude, Mm -hmm. let me tell you what you did wrong. Right. Right. And, and, you know, and all the other men can can learn from that kind of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. And the men who aren't married yet, they can learn for when they do get married. Yep. Yep. And they also learn what to anticipate in marriage, right? Right. Because we do go with a lot of expectations that are, quite frankly, false. Yeah, yeah. That is, yeah, that's exactly right. Well, Glenn, we've had a very great conversation here. I've thoroughly enjoyed this, but unfortunately, many good things have to come to an end. And we're reaching that time in our show here. So um, if people want to find out more about you and what you do do you have a blog and email or e- some website that people can get in I touch do. with you I do they can um, go to Glenn two ends Glenn T Stanton dot com and mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. I've got stuff on there my books and things that I've written and you know articles and then just um, I have a post on there that I put on yesterday um, that is about a very fun, interesting little side road trip that I took. So I'm in Florida. I'm doing some speaking stuff. So they can go there. Glenn T. Stanton. Two ends in Glenn. Glenn T. Stanton. Dot com. And I hope this blog, this uh, interview, will show up very soon. Also. Yep, it will. Well, um, Glenn, is there uh, any final message you'd like to leave for the Deeper Waters audience today? You know what? It's it's just for us as individuals, for Christians, to realize that marriage does matter. It, mm-hmm. it matters individually, but it also married it, it also matters socially. And that we as Christians need to learn about what it is that marriage does, both scripturally and generally in culture, and be advocates, be mm. protectors yep. of marriage, and learn how to do that, and apologetically, you know. Uh-huh. to make the case for why marriage matters, both theologically and sociologically and just generally humanly. Well, then it really has been a great conversation here, especially since it's about one of my favorite topics here. And I really hope that we will see you back here again sometime. I would enjoy it, and I've had a great, great time with you, Nick, and blessings, and, and thank you for having me. Thank you, and I remind everyone that, again, I'm not going to be here next week because I'm enjoying my fifth anniversary with Allie, because, yes, I do make her a priority. But um, when we come back here in two weeks, we're going to have Dee Dee Warren with us talking about her book, It's Not the End of the World, and I hope you'll be here listening to a good talk about eschatology. For now, I am Nick Peters, and I am signing off.